Hi, my name is Ariana Ranabat, and I'm an undergraduate studying astrophysics at University of Wisconsin-Madison. I have the pleasure of working with my co-worker Nikon and my mentor Susan on this project, which is the potential effects of volcanoes on geochronal hydrogen emissions. I hope you enjoy. In order to understand how the climate changes, long-term data sets are needed. Our research group analyzes data from the thermosphere and exosphere, which are the top parts of the atmosphere as seen on the image. The sun goes through periods of low and high activity, and this process is called the solar cycle. The solar cycle is a major source of natural variability in our emissions, as a certain type of radiation called Lyman beta flux induces Balmer alpha emissions about 12% of the time. From minimum to minimum, the solar cycle lasts about 11 years. This graph shows the cycle on large timescales, but my research team is analyzing timescales around 1 to 2 solar cycles. Balmer alpha emission is the radiation emitted from a hydrogen atom when an electron moves from the n equals 3 shell to the n equals 2 shell. This radiation is around 656 nanometers in wavelength. An image of Balmer alpha emissions is shown on this page. There are three things that the rate of Balmer alpha emissions vary with. One, the amount of Lyman beta flux. Two, the density of hydrogen. And three, the viewing geometry with respect to the sun. The viewing geometry with respect to the sun is where the shadow height comes in. Shadow height is the distance from the Earth to the top of the Earth's shadow which is a region of space shielded by the sun's radiation. We analyze the intensity of the hydrogen emissions with respect to the shadow height of the data. We use data from the Wisconsin H-alpha mapper fabry perot interferometer, or WAM for short. WAM examines a spatial column extending up into the atmosphere, and the hydrogen alpha emissions are integrated along the column. Most of these emissions will come from right above the shadow height since the density of hydrogen illuminated by the sun is highest at this point. A sample spectra is shown, including emissions from both geochronal hydrogen and the galaxy. I use the Voigtfit spectral fitting code created by R.C. Woodward to fit model Gaussians to the data. After the data are fit, I can calibrate them with comparison to Balmer alpha emissions from the North American Nebula, also known as NAN. Then I can plot the intensities versus shadow height. Each point on the graph is one spectral data, and the different colors correspond to different dates. Spectral data with viewing geometries greater than 50 degrees are left out due to uncertainties in atmospheric scattering. Hydrogen in the upper atmosphere is a byproduct of chemical reactions in the lower atmosphere. One of these gases is water vapor. Water vapor is the most abundant volcanic aerosol and could potentially affect hydrogen composition in the upper atmosphere. This is what my research focuses on. How can you tell how big an eruption is? Well, for this, we use VEI. VEI is a range of explosive strength that considers three things. The volume of tephra, which is volcanic ash and other material ejected, the height of the ash plume, and the type of eruption. The photo shows some iconic eruptions in their corresponding VEI. The Ring of Fire is a 25,000 mile stretch of land around the Pacific Ocean that contains an abundance of seismic activity. Roughly 75% of all active volcanoes lie on the Ring of Fire, along with 90% of all earthquakes. This is caused by plate tectonics. The ring of fire is situated mostly around the Pacific plate. Since the plates sit atop a molten mantle, they can crash into one another and pull apart. When a plate crashes into another plate, it makes a convergent boundary and volcanoes are formed. Here is an image showing this process. On the right hand side is a converging boundary. Typically, a trench is created parallel to the volcano chain, such as the well-known Marianas Trench. There are three main types of volcanoes, composite or stratovolcanoes, cinder cone volcanoes, and shield volcanoes. These are ordered from most explosive to least explosive. 
However, the volcano I analyzed was a special case as it is a pyroclastic shield volcano, which can be quite explosive. I analyzed volcano Rabul, located in Papua New Guinea. On October 7, 2006, after months of smaller activity, Rabul massively exploded with a VEI of 4. The photo shows the eruption. I plotted intensity versus shadow height for dates surrounding the October 7, 2006 eruption. These dates included were February 2, 2006 in yellow, March 14, 2007 in blue, and April 20, 2007 in green. I chose these dates because the range of the volca volcanic activity was quite big, with emissions starting from August 11, 2006 all the way until January 31, 2010. However, the bulk of the eruption occurred on October 7th, therefore, I wanted to see if this specific eruption had any impact on our data. Right now, there doesn't seem to be any significant difference between the dates before and after the main eruption. However, more data is needed to make a more complete profile to track the eruption and emissions. There are a few reasons why we may or may not see a difference in the data from before and after the volcanic eruption. For one, our interferometer was located across the world from the eruption at Kitt Peak, Arizona. Additionally, the VEI of the eruption may not have been significant enough, or perhaps maybe volcanic aerosols have no effect on our data at all. In 2009, WAM moved to Chile. For my next steps, I would like to analyze a 2011 eruption in Puhe, Chile, while WAM was stationed at Cerro Tololo, Chile, to see if there's a difference when a VEI-4 eruption is closer to the detector. Thank you all so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.